Hello and welcome once again to Listen Up A Minute. I'm John Dowell. My co-host Felicia Winston is out for the evening, so I'll be going solo this show. We've got a great show for you again, as always. We've got a good guest, Mr. Dempsey Murphy, who has a myriad background, uh, just a wonderful life experience, who's, and he's going to be sharing that with us. Bill McGee will also be joining us a little later, and he's going to give us a five-minute political segment, if you will, continuing from his last show, and again telling us why it's important to vote. So stay with us. We'll be right back with more of Listen Up a Minute. To listen up a minute. Again, I'm John Dow going solo this evening in the absence of my co-host Felicia Winston. As I said before the break, Bill McGee will be joining us talking more about the upcoming midterm elections and why it's important that we all get out to vote. It's too late to register for this election. However, there are things that you can do to help make sure that your voice is heard as well as others and we'll get into that more later. But right now, I want to get to our first guest, our featured guest, Mr. Dempsey Murphy. Murphy, good to see you again, and thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure being here. Absolutely my pleasure being here. Mr. Murphy is a 22-year retired Army veteran, Master Sergeant, and I guess in short terms, that would be E-8. Correct. Vietnam veteran and Desert Storm veteran. Now, for those who are familiar with that, that's a big gap between services, if you will, from Vietnam, which I guess ended in 73, 74, 74. somewhere mm-hmm. in there, to Death of Storm, which is up in the 90s, early 90s. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about that and how you saw campaigns and that was a 20-year Oh, absolutely. Campaign. Vietnam was a different sort of a monster when it comes down to individuals being right. assigned to the military. I don't care what branch you were in. During that period, there was a lot of protests. There was a lot of things that was extremely negative about being in the military. However, uh, when it came down to Desert Storm, it was a totally different attitude. Uh, I would say that it was a 180 degree difference in the way we treated our soldiers and their respect amongst the community and the mission that we were sent on. So uh, I I see the difference uh, is tremendous when it comes down to the attitude about Americans and our soldiers and their support. Now you said Vietnam was not a good experience, a very different beast if you will. But you spent 22 years in the military, so you made it work for you, and some obviously good things came out of it. Talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Well, the difference is is that uh, when we first, when I first came in, it was a system called being drafted. And when you're drafted, it's sort of like uh, being told that you're going to give up your life for a year or two, and there is virtually nothing that you can do about it. So there was a lot of individuals who were in the military who were not quite happy. And then when you think about being deployed to a hostile environment and then not volunteering for it, it made things really difficult for anybody who was in that position. However, uh, all of that changed around 1975 when it all became an all-volunteer army. And uh, if you were in a war zone, you asked for it. Pretty much. And when I say that, not necessarily you asked for war, but you volunteered to be in the military at a time when it was going to a conflict or a war situation, and you volunteered to be in the military at that time. Okay. Which is an extreme difference from being drafted. (laughs) (laughs) No question. (laughs) And like you said, that was whatever branch. No it matter did what, not yeah. matter whichever branch you were in. Well, the Air Force was just a little bit different. And when okay. I say that about the Air Force, only because it was always volunteer. However, the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, uh, in the 60s, you were either volunteered or you were drafted. And most okay. of them were drafted. At that time, the Coast Guard, if I remember, they were part of DOD. Now they're part of Homeland Security. How, what role or how were they a part of that? Well, they are uh, the National Guard. The, all of those individuals are a part of the military, as you know, yeah. but they are not uh, what you call the regular Army, okay, or the regular Marines or the regular Air Force. And because of that, uh, even merchant Marines are considered to be military right. in certain situations. Right. So, uh, but when you talk about putting on a uniform, it's another whole 
it's a different attitude. Different okay? attitude. Different attitude. Different so, attitude. but but they're all a part of providing service for the American idea and the American people, and so they are they are worthy of um, uh, being veterans yeah. also. Did you know at some point that you were going to spend a career or retire from the military? Well, to be yes and no. Okay. When I first went in the military, I was drafted. And I got out and I went back to that wonderful city called Baltimore. And it was 1970. And uh, things were not as pleasant uh, for me as I thought it would be coming okay. home from the military. And so uh, I looked around and got a couple of jobs and this, not and the other, and I wasn't happy. And I said, I like the military better than anything I'm doing right now. So I enlisted. And once I did uh, uh, my first term, I was going to get out and I was going to open up a printing shop. Okay. And my goal was is to be a printer. Uh, however, things didn't work out, uh, not necessarily for money and this and that the other, but there was a lot of other things that did not pan out, and so therefore, I wound up choosing to stay in the military, and I have not looked back, and I have not regretted it at all. We're here with Dempsey Murphy. I'm John Dowell, and this is Listen Up a Minute. Mr. Murphy, you said you wanted to open up a printing business. Mm -hmm. At that time, did the Army did they have? Did they have any training? Did they train you? Oh, absolutely not. Not for this. This okay. is something that I had uh, um, pursued in high school. You see, there is this thing that uh, uh, a lot of people falter on. It's one of my major, major uh, campaigns is to get uh, CTE training uh, that and and uh, vo technical, vocational technical training in, back into our schools. Okay. okay? But simply because most people do not learn. From not from from not being experienced and touching, feeling, and putting their hands on stuff. A lot of folks have to learn that way. Right. Conceptually, eh, you know, there are folks who can can learn that way. But how? But in reality, most people want to be able to experience what they're learning, and then it's more it's imprinted on their brain more. So therefore, uh, when it comes down to printing, it was something that I thought that would be uh, uh, down my alley. Well, as you know, the military has changed over the years, and now pretty much you can get training in just about anything. That is true. Anything well, I, 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 guess I, I guess I didn't really answer your question earlier. Okay. The question is, is, did the military assist me in that? Okay. What the military was going to do for me is to try to transition me from out of the military into civilian, civilian. life. However, during that period, there was nothing in the military that said, gotcha. you, there's a printing program for you that we're going to put you in that, that will lead you to mm -hmm. open a, mm -hmm. a printing shop. No, it did, that didn't exist. Those experiences came from me, like I said before, for the CTE training that I had prior to coming into the okay. military. And so no, the answer would be no, that the military did not help me with that. However, they give me a lot of other skills like um, uh, typing and a few other things that, that will assist me in, in, in providing those kind of services, like a printing service to a community. Did your CTE, CTE skills help you while you were in the, when you went in? Without a doubt. Most so, people don't yeah. realize that when you're talking about CTE training, you're talking about having to know how to measure things, how to, how to, to judge things. And, and there's so many different aspects of uh, individuals who are carpenters and, and bricklayers and seamstress and things of this nature that you will not learn uh, in English and math and science. Okay, right. But the math part, believe it or not, between CTE training and music, education would become a lot easier for almost anyone period. You learn those two skills, especially in music, you will not have too many problems in math. Can you give us an example of that? Because there's someone out there saying, what? You mean I can learn how to play the drums and become good at math? I can be a violinist? Absolutely. And be good at math? Well, the deal is, is this. All the notes, quarter notes, half notes, all those sort of things. That's just one thing, okay? okay. And not to mention all the other things that goes along with Producing a piece of music that would you be re that's required that requires math hmm. it just does. How do you get the prospective student excited about learning? Maybe just not only math and music, but learning. Period. Well, the deal is is this: learning is a desired and a mandated thing. Uh, some things they make you learn. 
Oh, they they okay. force you. Got to learn how to write. You got to. You must learn some of these things if you if you're in that environment. There's other things, as we know, it's called electives, and most people are forced to do certain things. But when you talk about electives, you're going to wind up understanding that a lot of people will go with their passions or what their yes. parents did yes. or whatever someone else done. And at that point, that's when they wind up going into those different genres. You mentioned Baltimore. I take it that's your home and where you went to school. What was that like? Oh, my education in Baltimore was second class. I grew up in the 60s, and um, we got secondhand books, and we got, you know, next to almost no great instruction when it comes down to um, uh, 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 finishing books and things of this nature okay. when it comes down to a course. Okay. And, uh, and I had the opportunity to go to a school called Mercenthaler, which was my counterpart in Maryland. You see, there was in Baltimore City, in the Maryland Scholastic Association, there was only two vocational technical institutions in that mm -hmm. community. At that time, one of them was black, and the school was called George Washington Carver Vocational Technical High School. The other one was called Mergenthaler, the guy who pretty much invented the printing press, and uh, it was Lily White. But by 1962, there was a program that allowed the individuals from uh, uh, Carver to go to Mergenthaler as a uh, means of reward for being an outstanding student, which I was. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Mr. George Johnson, who was my instructor, got, on at, uh, got me to go to uh, Mercenthaler on shop days. You see, our school had this wonderful program where it was a 10-day schedule. First, you would have, uh, uh, let's say on a Monday, math, English, science, and gym, and all that sort okay. of stuff. The very next day, shop all day long. The next day, English, math, science, and whatever. The next day, shop all day long. So one week you would have three days of shop. The next week we only have two. Got it? Okay. And so that was our that was our curriculum during that period. And so on the days that I did not go to Carver, I would go to Mergenthaler because they would send me there so I could go and see what that experience was like and let me share with you. It was remarkable. We only had two light tables. They had 10. We only had three presses. They had 20. We, I can't tell you how many tables that of you know those old school um, uh, uh, different types of styles of type yeah. you know old yeah. English and this and that and the right. other. They had banks and and and, and trays that uh, it was at least twenty times more than what we had. I didn't count those, but I will share with you that the experience in the quote unquote the non black school okay. versus the white school was totally different. Yeah, you said you went a couple of days academic couple of days shop every other day every other day every other day when i was in high school before the dark well the, the dark ages and i like to say before <laughs> cell phones all right to a lot of people you had a choice uh scientific collegiate collegiate business vocational general so you could choose one and then have some electives in the other whereas it sounds like you got the academics and the vocational if you will well that is that true one. because our, our goal is a vocational technical yeah. school okay. and okay. uh and, and even some of our electives were mandated like you know uh, mechanical drawing and those okay. sorts of things okay. they were mandated for us simply because of the fact that uh it was a part of our curriculum in order to graduate or to matriculate through whatever realm that was okay so yeah there was a lot of things that we had to do that was not necessarily uh going towards a college degree it was going towards a profession now, it's interesting because you mentioned not going towards a college degree, and we'll pick up on that when we come back after the break. This is Listen Up A Minute. Hey, everybody. It's Felicia Winston, your host of Listen Up A Minute. I want you guys to check out the trailer for my stage play, Forsaken. It definitely touches on topics about domestic abuse and a lot of other topics that you definitely don't want to miss. So check it out. You can go to my website, Make it rain, and that's not like rain drops. It's rain like rain supreme, R-E-I-G-N dot com. That's make it rain dot com. You'll see the Forsaken trailer there. Click on it. Enjoy. Welcome back to Listen Up a Minute. I'm John Dowell along with Dempsey Murphy. And uh, Mr. Murphy, I want to close out on the education piece a little bit. We were talking during the break about mechanical drawing and perspectives and measuring and how a certain amount of math is involved in that skill. And again, you know, math is one of those banes, if you will, for a lot of us. But just briefly touch on 
how a little bit of math skill or skills, you know, is needed when it comes to mechanical drawing and perspectives and compasses and protractors and squares and triangular rules. That, that, I took mechanical draw. And so apparently I you know. are quite well versed on it too. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of it all is that I think you pretty much touched on pretty much all the aspects of it. It's both basic math. And it has a tendency to solve a lot of our educational problems when you understand it. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where, you know, uh, my attitude was towards uh, the printing and, and, and okay. being in a vocational technical school. Uh, and, and I believe, period, I really believe that there are so many individuals who don't get the proper education right now simply because they don't they're not feeling it. They're not. They're, they're not engaged, and, and there is nothing in it, in the school that makes them really want to come. And so, uh, and then there are so many people who are not going to be lawyers and doctors and teachers. Sure. And then on top of all of that, you need an electrician. You need an auto mechanic. <laughs> I mean, you need. You absolutely need a, a carpenter. Okay. Well, so when you think about s some of your basics, okay, uh, it's in those fields. Now, I'm not saying that it's for everyone. What I'm saying is, is that you should not exclude it in your educational system. The lawyers have to have an office to work out of. They need a vehicle to get to work. If they're in the metro area, public transportation, they still have to run and people have to get those going. And folks, if you don't think he knows what he's talking about, uh, he matriculated through, let's uh, see here, Hartford Community College, University of Chicago, and VSU right down right down the way. So Morgan State and oh, okay. and Baylor, okay. okay. So it's, it's, Baylor. and a few others, okay. <laughs> but no, no, seriously, the deal is is yeah. that I wound up with 163 credit hours wow. without a formal degree, and okay. the reason for that is is because it did not serve me okay. in that in that time because okay. I was in the military. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting out no time soon. Okay. I was getting highly educated, but at the same time, I was um, uh, taking courses for my betterment, for okay. just my personal understanding. And so it helped me greatly, believe me, okay? okay. Uh, there are a lot of people who are trying to get a J-O-B mm -hmm. through education. Mm -hmm. I was already at a great job. Okay. So you understand, okay. so by the time I got out at 40 years old, 41 years old, uh, um, even trying to get a degree, I, I went to Virginia State University, and they wanted me to do 30 hours. I already had like 157 hours then. Okay. I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> there is no way in the world I'm going to give you. And then had to pay money, too, on top right. of all, okay. even though I retired. Okay? Right. You know, I could, right. And I could use my GI yeah. Bill. It was just still yeah. my money. I could have used this for something yeah. else. You know? So okay. the bottom line is, is that um, when it comes down to education, I honestly believe that everyone should go out and seek it but you should seek it for your betterment. Okay. It's not about to get a job, it's about for you to understand. Okay. And once you understand, people will give you a job. <laughs> Let's switch gears, if you will, to voting. You know we have a midterm election coming up and we talked off air, if you will, and, and that's something that, that you're passionate about. Absolutely, voting is one of the most basic, in fact, it's one of the two basic rights, the most two important basic rights that anybody, any American has. Okay. The first one is, of course, is free speech. And uh, I wrote an article in this newspaper right here about voting. Okay. And I will tell you that um, voting is uh, uh, an amazing thing, but also uh, uh, free speech is, is one of these things where uh, you can say pretty much what you want. Yes. But there are consequences. And the consequences are is for things such as hate speech, hate speech. And the moment that you start doing that, of course, you have to be accountable for it. And there are things that one can do to incarcerate you at a certain point. Yeah. Now, but <laughs> that's hate speech, of course, citing riots and things of this yeah. nature. Yeah. All those things can but the deal is is that you do have the right and the ability to say whatever it is that you want to say. In America, you have that right, but the deal is, is that will you survive after you said it? Now that's another whole, whole ball game. The next thing is, is voting, and this is where most of us have, at least I have my biggest problem when it comes down to Americans, but only, only because only half of us vote. And I learned something quite disturbing, that the, one of the major determining factors of an individual voting is whether or not that individual has a college degree or not. And that is an amazing concept because, let's face it, education in America is 
vital in order for, like I said, we were talking about earlier, right. getting jobs and things right. of this nature, but it also puts you in another category when it comes to understanding and okay. why it's important. And a lot of us feel as though that voting is not something that's going to benefit us. When I say us, I'm talking about certain people, okay. and I'm and I'm not one of them. But when I say us, I don't want to exclude me because I there are certain you. aspects of of government that I just don't like. Okay. There are certain people that are um, uh, that are in politics or as running for certain for certain things that just don't appeal to me. Okay. And and so an individual has to decide on an individual basis, and collectively we normally come up with the right thing. But if you don't vote a lot of people's voices are not heard, and so therefore that end result is slanted. Now folks, he said something earlier, and I hope you caught it. He said we here in America have the right to vote, and a lot of times we often forget that every country does not have free and open elections. You know, you die or get shot or run over, run out of your country if you don't vote for the right person. Some countries, people die just trying to vote. So I, I don't know how many people picked up on it, but you said we in America. Right, well, but understand right something, America, America should be the leader in, 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 in voting privileges. Yes. There are many countries, many countries, that the day that you're born, as long as you don't mess up things, like you know, murder somebody mm -hmm. or rob and all that sort of stuff, you have the right to be a voter. Just because you are a citizen, okay. and that's what we are. We are citizens of the United States of America, and the Constitution is written for a citizen. And so, therefore, if you do not exercise your right, somebody else mm -hmm. can dictate how you live. Because let's face it, everything about voting goes all the way down, not necessarily to the, for the president, the dog catcher, yeah. the, the folks in your club, or every, the, the, something, the, the, the school president. Mm -hmm. Voting is an amazing thing, and if you don't cast yours, you lose. I don't care. You, you can't win by not voting. The reason for that is because you're letting someone else cast your opinion. Now, you held up that newspaper, the black, the National Black Unity News. Uh, we talked about this a couple of years ago when you get when you were going to get it started. You said, John, I've got a newspaper coming out and I just want you to be on the lookout because it's coming. And folk, here it is right there. John is In true. Color. That's right. Now let me share this with you, John. This is this is an amazing thing. First of all, uh, this national this national Black Unity newspaper is a godsend, and when I say that, not for me, through me. Okay. My brother David, in 1990, had the largest distribution of a minority newspaper in the entire state of Maryland, and as newspapers go, uh, the way they are funded causes them to now lose money on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. The reason that we decided to do this is because we have found a way to make a nickel and on top of that provide great service to a community and on top of all of that, it is a positive, solution-oriented periodical. And so we are quite proud of this and David has, is an amazing little brother. <laughs> when I say that, even though he's six foot two, you know, and not taller than I uh -huh. am, he is still my younger brother, and I love him dearly. But this is something that uh, pulled me out of retirement, and it's something that I believe that our community can thrive off of because it is designed to assist us in getting out of our own way to produce a better result. And I, I'm telling you, you had to believe in it. Number one, you'd always said, John, I'm happily retired. And, <laughs> yeah. I, and I plan on staying that yeah, way. Yeah. And as you know, and hopefully our listeners know, the viewers, newspapers have been dying for years, at Absolutely. least according to the experts. They know, are. Newspapers they are. are folding in major newspapers, even the local newspapers. None of them are making money. So to come out with a newspaper in print, in color, and then to turn a profit, but more importantly, you said this offers some solutions. Oh, absolutely. And, and you see, when you have something that is um, divinely inspired, yes. uh, you don't have to do a lot of work. It will come to you. I promise you that it's not, this is not a hard job, okay? Mm -hmm. In fact, this is a true pleasure. People are coming out of the woodwork to be a part of this okay. simply because it is a solution-oriented periodical that is designed to help our community, primarily the black community, communities that are underprivileged, and for those individuals who have great wealth to assist them in understanding where we are. Okay. And 
Before we wrap up, you wrote a commentary in this paper about voting. Oh, yes, I did. And, and tell us about that. And also, uh, you partnered up with the Get Out the Vote campaign and some t uh, Get Out the Vote pledge with LJB Enterprises. So it's a joint effort in getting people registered, getting people aware, getting people engaged, getting people to vote, but making sure that they're knowledgeable. One of the reasons so I, I am so sorry. One of the reasons that I am here is because uh, uh, LB Productions, Mr. Larry Brown himself, uh, got a copy of this newspaper. He read it. He was quite enthralled with it. And yeah. then when I wrote this article on voting, uh, and he is a part of uh, the Get Out the Vote pledge, yeah. and because of what I wrote and because of what you guys are doing, he thought it would be a wonderful merge, and I agree. And so that's the reason why I'm here. Normally, I do not spend my time trying to do this. I got other things to do, but however, this is an amazing um, uh, partnership, and it is an amazing effort. People don't realize it, but voting should be one of the things that you look forward to, not something you should, you should dread, okay? Voting is something that will allow you to have a voice no matter what the situation is, as long as you're eligible to do it, you should do it simply because if you don't, someone else will have the opportunity to do something that you don't like and get away with it. <laughs> On that note, we're going to say goodbye to Dempsey Murphy. Another great show as always. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Folks, when we come back, Bill McGee is going to be back to give us some more political talk. This is Listen Up. Florida has 29 electoral college votes, all right? Your state has the same number of electoral college votes as you do representatives in the House and the two represent and the two senators. That's how they determine, because a lot of people say, well, how do, you, how do they even determine electoral college? If your state has 10 uh, districts, House districts, you have 12 electoral college votes. You got 10 for the House and your two senators. So to know how many votes you have, DC I think has three. If, if, I think it's three that DC gets. Well, the electoral college put Donald Trump in the presidency based on three states. There were six states all together that could have been flipped had enough people showed up. But when I dug down into the numbers, there were three states. It was Wisconsin, Michigan, and Florida. Had enough, 148,000 votes. All we needed was another 100, and out of 93 million, you only needed 148,000 people to show up and vote for Hillary and Donald Trump would not have been president. Welcome back, folks. That's gonna do it for this edition of Listen Up A Minute. I just wanna say that we, the Listen Up A Minute talk show team, we're very happy to be teaming up with the Dempsey Brothers and this publication, the National Black Unity News, a solution-oriented newspaper. And again, we're glad to partner up with them when good people get together great things can happen. Until next time, for the entire Listen Up team, I'm John Dowd.